So my name is Carl Schultz. I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, working together on frameworks for HPC systems, but really the intent is to introduce a new community, and Brock uh, mentioned it in the last presentation, and this is called OpenHPC. And what I have today is sort of a mix of overview types of slides for motivation for the project, uh, what we're trying to do both short term and hopefully long term. And also sort of some technical overview about um, how the build process works, what's really included in OpenHPC today, talk about uh, the testing uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so it's a mix of, of overview and some technical things. Hopefully uh, that's okay with everyone here. So as I said, we'll have a little bit of motivation for the effort, uh, talk briefly about the vision and the participants. And then I want to go over the current components and uh, talk about the hierarchical approach that's being taken for this HPC software stack. And this is not new to this particular stack, but I think it's a, you know, a good approach that is used uh, at a number of sites around the world. And then I want to go into some of the development infrastructure, uh, talk about packaging conventions that are being used, talk about the build system, talk about documentation. I know that's an evil thing, but I, I want to spend at least a couple of words on it. And then we'll, we'll end up uh, with integration testing and then talk about opportunities for participation. And feel free, uh, hopefully people can ask questions along the way, Brock, is that fair? We're just, it's a small crowd, so uh, just ask. If anything looks uh, dodgy, just put your hand up and we'll try to deal with it up front. All right, so what is the motivation for the effort? Um, you know, to start with, what you're going to see from OpenHPC is this really is a collection of a number of common packages that we use uh, on, on Linux systems when we build HPC systems. And, you know, to, to let you know my background, I come from an academic supercomputing environment. Prior to joining Intel, I was at the Texas Advanced Computing Center for about a decade, and I led the HPC groups uh, there for a while and an applications group. And one of the things that we sort of learned over the years when we'd interact with our colleagues at other supercomputing sites is that we were duplicating some, some bit of effort, right? You know, open source is so predominant in HPC, and we all rely on a number of key packages. And when you talk to your colleagues at other sites, you find yourselves going, oh, yeah, we're building that. And yes, we got burned by that little issue, too. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we should do something about that at some point. Well, this is an attempt to try to do something about that. And so, you know, we're saying that um, we're trying to aggregate a large suite of open source projects. And, you know, we don't want to reproduce things that are already out there. So the focus here really is on HPC packages, things that don't come from the distro. Or if they do come from the distro, they don't come in a timely enough fashion. And that's something we see in HPC quite frequently is that, you know, the time scale that distros put out things, even, even when we get packages upstream, it's kind of at a much slower pace than what we're used to for deploying HPC systems. Um, now, one of the things that we know going into this is you always have this careful balance between being very prescriptive um, on, uh, you know, the tools that you use. And that's something in particular when you go from one site to another, you know that they have a mixture of tools. And they've been developed over a long period of time, um, usually internal tools, external tools. And, and that tends to be around things like provisioning, um, how they manage their software installations, whatever configuration management scheme that they use. And so although the functionality is similar, it's not the same. Um, exactly. And so we need to be cognizant of that. The other thing is that, you know, we're aware of the fact that if you are a developer of open source, um, you know, tool, maybe an MPI stack, we have some of our friends from OSU here who, who develop a, a leading MPI stack. One of the things that they end up doing is having to triage a lot of HPC installations, right? And it's not really the fault of the software, but it's often, you know, was the software installed correctly? Do they do all the other things that they need to do to make it work? And so if you are, if you're in the business of providing high quality software to the community, you sort of also have to be in the business of troubleshooting other people's supercomputers. And so we hope that, the, you know, that's part of the motivation here is that if there was a centralized resource, and if it could be successful, that maybe this will help minimize some of that developer effort. So that's one part of the effort. And when we, when we think about this in terms of motivation, one of the questions that we asked is, can we provide community value by focusing just on one thing, one least common denominator? And the common denominator here that we um, focused on up front is the configuration and packaging of HPC software. 
And you know, we're, we're starting off by trying to focus on packages that are in use across a lot of sites and establish some basic packaging guidelines. We want to embed some hierarchical support, um, and I'll go, I'll go through this a fair bit more. Um, it's a common problem that you run into when you're dealing with HPC systems. We, though we want to go beyond just sort of aggregating the source code, right? we also want to provide this in an integrated fashion. So when you talk about integration, that means binary distributions and having, a, having the ability to install binaries. And of course, once you start doing that, you need to think about upgrade mechanisms. So that's, uh, that's part of the motivation here as well. And, and to be fair, this is something where we think that distros do a really good job. Um, so we want to try to leverage that expertise where possible. And because of what I mentioned on the first slide is, you know, if you walked in and picked a configuration management scheme and, and you know, um, one provisioning scheme to rule all of them, I think you would limit the possibility of reuse across um, a large number of sites. And so we are purposefully trying to not be overly prescriptive here to start with. And you know, I'll, I'll just use the example that we always have in, in Flame Wars, which is you know, this is, tends to be a matter of personal preference, like editors. And there really is only one editor. I, I put it up here so you know which one it is. But I'm told there are people who, who believe otherwise. Um, so you're going to see when I talk about uh, the packages here, and we've mentioned um, you know, how, how these are integrated, but I want to make sure that it's understood that these really are building block types of, of things. We're not trying to be super prescriptive. We want to have recipes which are prescriptive so that someone can, from end to end, reproduce and install uh, and, and use that to manage a system. But we don't want to force it down people's throats, because I think that limits the, the overall attractiveness. All right. So um, assuming that, the, that we are successful for the top part, you know, we want to go beyond that as well. So this, this first effort is really focusing on integration. But that's you know, one piece of the puzzle. And for a long-term sort of sustainable community, we want to we go beyond that. And some, some examples of things to do beyond that are looking for uh, exploring interface points between components. And you know, one of the ones that we tend to use when we talk amongst ourselves is thinking about this desire on, you know, not as much today, but we know people want it going forward to have fine-grained control over the images that are, provi are provisioned onto a compute node. That's sort of the resource manager level, right? If a user submits a job, they may want to have it with a, a one image that's different than another user. And so when you think about that kind of level of integration, it means having to um, have deep integration between the provisioning system and the resource manager. And then if you think about from a community point of view, gosh, it would be nice if I could sort of swap out the provisioner with a different one. It sort of implies that it would be nice to have some, some abstraction points. And so these are things that we're thinking about uh, going forward. Where does it make sense to have these abstraction points? And then on top of just sort of the, the component interoperability, Another key element is that you know, we want to have this really be a, a research vehicle as well. Be able to support new codes, new programming languages, new runtime systems that are being developed now that are you know, in, intended to, to help move towards exascale. You know, but when you think about these, a lot of times they have integration issues as well, and they might be hard to use the first time. So we're hoping that something like OpenHPC can make some of these new research efforts available in, in a reasonable fashion so that people can test them out, provide feedback, and you know, really sort of have a mixture of what we would think of today as being sort of the stable type of HPC platform using um, you know, common tools, but also have the ability to march forward to integrate new research efforts. Now, in terms of the architecture, you know, there's nothing novel really here. Uh, I think for those of us who've been in the HPC business, we've probably all drawn some kind of picture that is on the right. Uh, the point that I just want to make for where we're starting off today you know, with OpenHPC is we sort of have the notion of a flat um, architecture versus a hierarchical architecture. You know, and flat, in some sense, really sort of goes to the size of the system, you know, might be upwards of you know, depending on the provisioning system, a couple of hundred nodes, you know, two to three hundred nodes. And then when you start to go above that, um, you tend to start to think about this hierarchical notion of, of how the system is viewed. And we're doing, you know, in terms of the way we talk about the architecture, we're doing the usual things where we break things up based on functionality. So, you know, you'll hear me talk about provisioning. Um, so there might be a provisioning pool of servers, obviously, hopefully, a large number of compute nodes, I.O. servers, um, login nodes, management nodes, all that 
uh, standard kind of stuff is, is the same kinds of things that we're doing here. I will mention um, we're going to see a recipe uh, along the way, and I, I just want to point out that the first recipe is using a diskless kind of scenario. So um, certainly doesn't mean you can't have a disk on the compute node, but from a provisioning point of view, all of it is happening over the network. Um, you know, this also tends to be an Emacs VI kinds of thing. If you're a diskless person, you just always assume diskless is the right way to go. Uh, I actually came from, from a center which was very much in the disk full camp um, and, you know, probably would never switch. Uh, so we do intend to support both of these. And these are the kinds of, you know, things that I think are important from a community point of view that, again, you can't be too prescriptive and say, no, you can only be diskless or you can only be disk full. I think we want to be able to develop recipes which accommodate what are really the prevalent types of use cases in HPC. Now, Brock mentioned um, you know, the formation of this community. It is very new. Uh, we just had an announcement earlier this week. Uh, he showed a slide with some of the partners. One thing I wanted to point out is that this is being done under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. So this is a Linux Foundation collaborative project. And you know, we have representation here from you know, a wide variety of folks is that you'll see, you know, folks from academia, folks from the research labs, uh, folks from OEMs, ISVs, you know, it's, it's a broad range of people who are interested in this. And, you know, we're really hopeful that getting this collection of folks together will really help in making, um, you know, the community very successful long term. Okay, so... I'm going to now start walking into what is in OpenHPC. And before we do that, you know, I, I want to set the stage that the motivation here is to try to not have just you know, the system installation or just the development tools. Um, you know, we, when we think of the life cycle of an HPC system, right, it often starts with a fair bit of work on the system side of things. You know, and I've, I've been involved in a number of of top 50 deployments and a couple of top 10 uh, deployments, you know, and that first part is, you know, I have the gray hairs to show it. I mean, it can be many months of, of working on an installation, um, but when you think about in the grand scheme of things, that's really small in terms of the overall life cycle associated with uh, the system, right? I mean, typically on the systems uh, at TAC, for example, if it was a top 10 system, that, that usually has at least a five-year life cycle. Um, and maybe the installation was order six months or something. So we want to try to be cognizant of the fact that there's, um, you know, there's an installation phase and there's a management phase. And you know, all, similar to I was talking about drawing up you know, the, the, the system architecture, I think if you've, you've drawn up your software architecture, there are many different ways to slice this, but you may have done something similar where you have a lot of, of hierarchical overlay, you know, starting at sort of the, the base OS, adding some runtime libraries, and then over on the right-hand side, we have things which are sort of development-oriented. We have you know, software development tool chains. That might be things like compilers. Lots of third-party libraries um, reside over here. And we need all of that before we can really build and run an application, right? And uh, in contrast, on the left-hand side, we have a lot of stuff that's more system-oriented. So the point here is that if you were to try to stand up a community, um, ideally, you'd want to have some elements that, that really come from all of these uh, spaces. And it's a big space, so, um, you know, one of the things I'm going to be very uh, forward about is, you know, it's impossible to have every permutation to start with that, that comes from um, a software architecture like this. But what we have done is because we want to be able to at least provide uh, from the community point of view, the ability to install a system from bare metal and have a pretty reasonable development environment. I'm going to show you we've, we've chosen from various elements from uh, this slide. All right. And in fact, on the next slide, we have here our starting uh, elements for OpenHPC. And you know, starting at the top in terms of the base OS, we ha I'll tell you we have the ability, uh, we'll go into the build system in a bit. Um, we put a lot of effort into being able to support n not just different versions of a base OS, but actually different distros themselves. Um, but to start with, what we have um, made available uh, this week is builds against CentOS 7.1. And I'm trying to show you know, the variety of packages here sort of grouped by functionality. So you see administrative tools, provisioning, resource management. Those map back to the, the functional component areas that we just looked at on the previous slide. And, you know, there's a couple of ways to think about this. You might go, hey, that looks like a lot of packages. And that'd be great if you feel that way. 
Um, it is a lot, having worked through all of these. It, it is a lot of packages. But at the same time, if you have been involved in deploying you know, a general purpose HPC system that supports thousands of users, which is sort of the background I come from, you'll know, well, wait, that's not everything that we need. And, and that's absolutely true. It is not everything we need, but it's, it's, it's hopefully a good representation of all the types of things you need. And certainly from the, the starting point of a development um, platform in terms of the MPI families and the compilers, you know, we're hopeful that that, that is a, a pretty mature set. And one of the things I want to point out is you'll notice, uh, you know, there's some things with asterisks here. So, for example, you'll see some Intel products, which you might go, wait a second, you know, this is an open source community. Those aren't exactly open source. And, and that's definitely true. But one of the things that we have tried to, um, you know, accommodate from a design point of view is a bring your own license model for OpenHPC. And the first, um, you know, example of that is through the inclusion of Intel Parallel Studio. And so that's why you see Intel MKL, um, Intel MPI, and some of the other performance analysis tools. And particularly on the development side, the reason we are motivated to do that is we want to make sure, you know, notice that there's a lot of, um, let me see in terms of, you know, there's IO libraries, and we look at numerical libraries, there's a lot of, you know, popular uh, MPI-based um, open source libraries here. And certainly a big part of what we would do when I was at TAC is be rebuilding this with a variety of compiler families. So we wanted to have the Intel compilers included because our experience has been a lot of times that's what people want to use. And so that's why we are adopting this uh, bring your own license model. And the intent is to certainly carry that forward beyond just Intel products, other ISV codes as well. And I'll show you some, some examples. Um, by the way, I do want to point out that the, uh, there was a change recently, at least for the Parallel Studio tools, um, that, that there are some new options for getting access to that in terms of if you come from academia or if you contribute to an open source um, project, you can go to this link and you can um, actually um, obtain those tools, uh, request a license for those for free. So uh, for a number of folks, particularly who work in open source, um, you know, there's not even an issue getting a license for these. So this is where we're starting off with. Um, there are some things I'm not showing, which are dependencies that you need to, to support some of these packages. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the fact that we are building a number of these for different compiler and MPI permutations. So if you notice here, there's three MPI stacks listed, and there's two compiler stacks listed. So if you work out you know, the fact that you need to build an MPI library against all of those, you have six builds to do. And so in the majority of the cases, that's what we're doing here. Now, there are some cases where, because of licensing restrictions, you know, depending on what the license is of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the component, that we can't provide it for all possibilities. But in the majority of the cases, there are six versions. And the resulting repository today is something around 250 RPMs. So this is where we're starting. It is just a start. Um, but as I mentioned, it was these were chosen so that we could have an end-to-end -end capability to install a system from bare metal and have a reasonably um, you know, rich development environment. Perfect. Yes, sir? Are you going to continue with that if you have another compiler, another API library, and you keep with the whole? So my, if possible, yes, right? But there is a combinatorial sort of explosion that happens there. But I do kind of feel that you know, that is a problem that is solved with more build servers, right? And if you have a lot of automation and you have enough testing infrastructure, to have confidence that you haven't broken something, and we're going to talk about testing infrastructure. In, in my perfect world, we would absolutely say yes, try to cover every permutation. Um, and the reason you know, I say that also comes from experience where when I was at an academic supercomputing center, we didn't do that all the time for various reasons. You know, We had sort of our favorite one that we put all of our effort into. But then we might make a second one available, but we didn't have all of the libraries. And it just opened us up to users going, well, I, you got it for that MPI library. Why don't you have it for this one? And you know, uh, it would be much easier if you have it for everybody. But I think it does hammer the point home that there's a difference here when you say, let's take on a new MPI stack versus another numerical library. And, and we do have to be careful about that. Yes, sir? Yeah, this, I mean, the Linux is the operating system. I mean, I Right. So how are you going to kind of deal with that? Deal with that. Yeah, so the question. I mean, the rest of it is, you know, internal content, but the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the OS is the base, but the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, the base is the OS. Right. So, I mean, the base
That's right. And so the question is, hey, we see a base OS of CentOS here. What about other distros? And I kind of alluded to the fact that the build system that we're using is purposely designed to handle multiple distros. And so the intent is to have multiple distros here. This is just what we have released on day one. So we have actually tested on SLES 12. Um, you know, there is the usual hand waving that tends to happen when you think about CentOS versus RHEL, of that there's kind of an equivalency there. But we also have interest in working with RHEL as well to do this. But CentOS is nice and clean from a community point of view because everybody has access to it. I'm sorry, can you? Ah. I see. Uh, so the question is, is there a pre-built system that perhaps the community could log into to play with, so to speak? So not today. Um, that's a good question. I mean, and something that I th is something good to talk about with the community of making something like that available. Uh, so it's not available today. What we have, you know, for the people who have tried it out, and I'll show you later on, I mean, everything that you see here is available as a YUM repository in the case of CentOS. And I'm going to talk about the fact that there's an installation process. So while there's not a system that you can log in directly, it's very easy to reproduce. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, sir. What is the caveat community version of the lesser client? The caveat. You've got no oh, oh, I see. Oh, oh, yeah. No, that was me being very specific on which version because there's now several versions of Luster, um, and so this this is the one you know that is put out by the community. It wasn't meant to be bad. It's just being very specific on on traceability where it comes from. Yeah, thanks. OK. Um, real quick, let me just tell you, so that's kind of what's there today. I, I alluded to the fact that it's a good list. It's very useful. People are, are building systems with it, and I think hopefully finding it um, convenient. But it's clearly not, uh, you know, it's not everything. And so here's just some examples with, with the collaborators that we mentioned, um, you know, who are part of forming this community. Some things that are, are being thought about for future efforts. And, and you see some things around, you know, it says base OS, but at the top these are really sort of microkernels and multi-OS. Um, there are some things around RAS, which is this Orkham business, another provisioning system, something like XCAT. Uh, another resource management, um, PBS Pro here. Uh, so there's a variety of things um, that people are interested in contributing. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to call out everything, but I, I wanted to show that these are some of the discussions that we've had with our partners. And one of the things that we'd be interested in is just your feedback as to other things that make sense and that can help us prioritize going forward. All right, so now I'd like to spend a little time talking about the software environment and the fact that um, we have chosen for things to be very hierarchical in nature. And so this is a snapshot that's trying to show um, how this is reflected in the software itself. So, you know, everything today, the way that we envision things starting off is you start off with a, a supported base OS, and then you start adding on things from an OpenHPC repo. So, right, the top part comes from your favorite base OS, and the bottom part would be something that is pre-packaged, right? Now, I mean, these, these are a collection of things which are coming from other open source communities, but these are being packaged and being made available as part of the OpenHPC repository. So some of these are general tools which have really no, no hierarchy involved, but as we start to move down in the development environment, recall that I mentioned we have two compilers, so there's a GCC compiler and G-Fortran and G++, of course and the Intel Composer on the right-hand side. And what we do is, because we're doing this combinatorial build, you know, that means that for an I.O. library like HDF5, there's a GNU version, and then there's an Intel version. Okay? And, but that's something that doesn't have MPI embedded in it. Now, people who know realize there's a parallel HDF5, and bear with me, that's, that's here too, but I'm, I'm using the serial version as an example. 
And then as we go in, you know, further into this hierarchy, and you think about the things that require MPI, and we'll use an example of Boost. So we have Boost included. Boost has an MPI. Um, you can optionally enable MPI in Boost. We find it convenient because it has a very nice C++ interface into MPI. So we do that. But what that means is that we have variants, uh, and you'll see also for Parallel HDF5, we have variants for GNU, and we have three variants, and then we have variants for Intel on the right-hand side. So this is where we get our combination of six different packages. And this even gives you a hint to what the packages are named. We just embed the compilers and the MPI stacks directly in here. And, ah, Lee, the resolution is really poor. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to see this one. Let me just say the point of this is to a lot of sites in HPC rely on the uh, modules program to sort of control a user environment. Um, and we did feel that while you don't want to be prescriptive on, on, on every single little thing, we felt that the way that users interact with the development environment is so crucial and so important that we, we have adopted a convention of using modules. It doesn't mean that we can't adopt a different convention going you know, forward, but what we have adopted thus far because of its prevalence in the community is modules. And the only point I want to make is that, you know, what you see as a user is a function of what you have loaded in your environment. And this is something that we sort of, um, at least at TAC, you know, they found to be very useful for their users over, over time. And it's hard to see, but when I'm, I'm showing what modules I have loaded, this happens to show that I have the GNU module and MVAPH2 loaded. And what that means is that I, when I do a module avail to see all the other software packages that are available on the system that were provided by OpenHPC, I get things which match that hierarchy, right? So the top part here shows that I have packages that were built for MVAPH against GNU. The second stanza is showing things that were built against the GNU compiler. And the bottom is just generic things which don't have a dependency. All right, and so the other thing that we're taking advantage of is the particular module system that we're using is called LMOD. It's developed at TAC. Um, it has a very convenient feature of it. it has this notion of hierarchies built into it. It's called families. And we're actually embedding into the OpenHPC packaging these module files. And I'll show you um, a little bit of syntax of how it works. But what, what this means is that you get for free, so to speak, because we've embedded it into it, the ability to switch your environment and have your state maintained in a clean fashion. So I apologize that it's hard to see this, but what I, I have the boost library loaded, and the only point here is that because I have the GCC compiler enabled, when I look at the library path that boost points to, it's the GCC one, okay? That's all to take away from that. Now, if I swap my environment between GCC and Intel, okay, because we have embedded this family business into our, our whole design, what we get is we see this is coming from LMOD. It says, hey, I noticed that you switched your environment. Let me do you the favor of updating some of these packages um, that you previously had loaded for GNU. And so that's what we see here is that it said, oh, I'm going to switch, I'm going to reload your boost and your MVAP pitch to be the Intel version. And if I echo that same environment variable, you know, then I notice that it's pointing to the correct Intel version. Right? And that's just one of sort of the, the convenient um, features of this hierarchical approach that we embed into um, OpenHPC. So, yes? Quick question. Uh, um, you showed uh, the shape of that tree is not necessarily That's right. That's an excellent question. <laughs> and uh, yes, I can. So um, at least I, as I, there's one part that I caught that is uh, actually not sneaky, but very, you know, the difference between the MPI stacks. So the question is, hey, some of the MPI stacks are more network agnostic than others, right? Yes. For example, Intel MPI, Open MPI, um, they might be able to simultaneously run on verbs based InfiniBand and PSM type of InfiniBand. I'm looking at these two guys right here, looking right at them. Yeah, I know. Um, so in that case, uh, you're right. We could embed that in, into here. 
we haven't yet, but because we are working with our friends in the community, and the two gentlemen here are from OSU, and they're the Mbappage folks, so um, there have, they have received multiple requests, you might say, to um, have a similar type of capability where you could have PSM and verbs all in one build. Um, now that's a very specific example, but there are going to be other cases that um, maybe we can't solve. And so I, we have not gone down that road to, to, to sort of say, oh, choose your interconnect in advance, right? right? The recipe you see now sort of assumes you either have you know, an, a Mellanox type of system or a TrueScale system, right? But I do think that going forward, this is something that we're going to need to be uh, cognizant of and design. My vision, my thought about this when we've talked about it is that we still keep the package names the same, but that you would make a decision sort of upstream and you might say, I have a who's he, what's it interconnect, right? You install the who's he, what's it, and then based on that, when you install the MPI stacks, you get the who's he, what's it version. If anybody comes out with a who's he, what's it interconnect, I want to <laughs> I want to cut. Yes, sir. Um, so what about what? Yeah, I guess you'll have to educate me on that one because I, I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just don't know that one. I do know, I mean, I, I kind of feel that you do run into a problem that if you have multiple things trying to own this particular environment, you run into problems, you know. So if, if you're going to expand into having multiple ones, that's, that's going to have to be architected. Okay. So now let's spend a little time talking about development infrastructure. Um, you might ask, or what are we using to get the job done? And, and to start with, gosh, this is so poor. Um, um, we have most of the usual software engineering stuff. So there, we're using GitHub for the source code. Um, I'll summarize all the URLs at the end. Uh, we're using Jenkins for continuous integration. And I did mention that we're going to talk about documentation. So I, I want to tell you that we're using LaTeX here because I'm going to kind of say why. Um, Another important part about this is not just what has the source code, but also the, the build system. And what we are using here is something called Open Build Service. This comes out of um, OpenSUSE and SLES, and in fact, it's what they use to, to build and release OpenSUSE. Um, and so what we are trying to do here is provide a common deliver delivery mechanism, so something that is very familiar to Linux admins. So you know, if you're a Red Hat person, it would be yum. If you're a SLES person, it would be Zipper. And at the end of the day, we're just delivering RPMs. Um, and the thought is that we'll have a base release of the RPM, so very similar to what the distros do. Have a base version and then an update version against that. And that's how we'll deliver updates against that base. Um, we have some unique requirements for the, the build system, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little time talking about that. But the main thing to know is that the inputs into everything, well, what do you need? You need the component tarball, and so let's say if it's Mvapage, well, that comes from the Mvapage folks. They're, they're the maintainers of that. So, um, you know, from the build system point of view, the real input for building RPM is a spec file, tarball with the source code, and any patches that are applied against it. So in the way that we've designed our OBS system, by the way, this is a standalone OBS. Um, if you're familiar with OpenSUSE, you may know that there's a, a public version of, of OBS available. And hold on just a second, I see. Um, but we're using a standalone version that we have in the cloud. And what we have done is we have uh, configured it so that it can talk to GitHub. So it has a Git back in. And it also has network access. So when it goes to build Mvapage, for example, it just downloads straight from the Mvapage um, uh, website. And, um, and then OBS takes care of doing all the builds. So I think there was a question. So the question is, have we solved the getting security updates problem for CentOS specifically? And no, we have not solved that because we are not providing the base OS here. The, the base OS, we would, you, know, you would still be getting from CentOS. Now, as we go forward, if we can have you know, relationships with RHEL that can make that available. But see, then you, know, you have to have an entitlement against that and stuff like that. So, but we have, 
We're using this in the same way you would, in the sense that it's input. OK. So let me spend a little time talking about OBS. Uh, this is where our OBS server lives, build.openhpc.community. Um, and we're using this to manage the build process end to end. And I've already I've mentioned that it can drive multiple repositories. We have done this, but what is available publicly that you would see on this website is just the CentOS version. Um, just so that you know, the way the builds are done, you know, the whole idea is to have a very reproducible and transparent build process. And so it, you know, it starts from scratch every time. It's installing everything it needs for every single build. Right? It's very different, at least, than what we used to do at our HPC center, where we had a build node who was dedicated to doing nothing but build. And if we needed to install a dependency, we did it by hand. This is very different, because you want it to be 100% reproducible. So if you have a dependency that comes from the base OS, you have to specify that. And so we're doing that. And the way the builds are done, in this case, is they're carried out in a Cheroot environment. That's how you have total control over it. Um, OBS actually can build in a KVM, but because we're running in the cloud, we're already virtualized, so we can't do double virtualization. Uh, and for the most part, the things that we care about is we get a binary RPM. But of course, you may want to customize, and you should absolutely feel free to customize. And so the source RPMs pop out of this as well, and it's very easy for you to reproduce the same kind of build that we just did under OBS because you have access to the source RPM. And the other thing that is convenient about this is that it actually publishes a repository and it keeps it up to date. So we let OBS take care of that for us. Um, and when I show you, you know, where you can point your YUM repository to it, it really is this OBS server. Um, in the sake of time, let me skip towards uh, some of the other more uh, important bits. The only thing I, I want to mention to you is this notion of carrying the hierarchy forward in the build system as well. So you know, one of the things you have to be careful of when you're sort of designing a software engineering environment, you don't want to have multiple inputs, right? You kind of want to have one input, you change code in one place, and you get all the builds that you need out of that. And so OBS actually has a convenient mechanism that we have taken advantage of, is that we can link packages against each other. And what this means is that for, an ex this is an example from Metis, which is a domain decomposition library. And what we have is we have one spec file to build all of our Metis builds. And Metis only requires, it's a serial library, so you only need GNU and Intel. But we don't have separate spec files. It all comes from one spec file. And we do a little bit of, of magic uh, using OBS, where we create a link from the Intel version to the GNU version, and we just tell it to build this with the Intel compiler. And it takes care of it. So the nice thing is that when a developer checks in a code, source code change to GitHub, there's a trigger which kicks off the build. And if it was Metis, it kicks off two builds for free. And if it was an MPI live, something that was built with MPI, it kicks off six builds. Um, and so that's something that's very convenient. Uh, let's skip forward to um, talking a little bit about our spec files. So I mentioned that the input into the build process is you know, source code, tarball, spec file, and any patches. And you know, to kind of give you a feel for how the hierarchy stuff is embedded, so. This is a snapshot, again, from the meta spec file. And the part in orange is trying to show you the fact that there's this notion of a family. It is a compiler family. It's set to GNU by default, but it can be overridden very easily. And so this is kind of in reference to what I just talked about, the fact that OBS is, when it wants to do an Intel build, it just defines this compiler family business. And that's how um, we maintain one spec file. So to be fair, your spec files get a little bit more complicated. Um, but it's a lot of template code, and I'm trying to show you what the template code looks like. The other thing that we do from a template perspective is embed the dependencies. And so that's what the blue bit here is trying to highlight. So you'll notice uh, there's a stanza here and this says, hey, if my compiler family is GNU, well, then I need to have a build requirement that says in my Cheroot environment, I better install the GNU compilers. And it also means that the end user who wants to access this library, they need to have the GNU compilers, right? You don't want to install Metis and then be in the unenviable position of not being able to use it. Uh, you actually want to have all of your dependencies. And so that's what uh, we're showing here, that we take care of, of that as well. All right. So now let's spend a little time talking about documentation. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through it. You can download. Oh, I'm, I'm going to walk you through tiny little bits, but not everything. The point is that if you looked at the outline here, I think it would be 
probably very similar to what you would see with any sort of cluster installation recipe, right? It starts off with pick a master server, install the base OS, now go off and do some things. And the things that we're doing, we're happy to get the, the components from OpenHPC, and there's some optional stuff, adding a Lustre client, enabling IP over IP, you know, setting up, restricting SSH access to the resource manager if you want to do those kinds of things. But that's sort of the middle part of the guide. And the second part of the guide is installing a bunch of development tools, you know, the compilers and all the third-party libraries. And the last part is getting the resource manager set up so that you can run jobs through it. Um, and so, you know, that's, what, that's how the guide stands today. I mentioned that, you know, one of the efforts that we're trying to do is to treat the documentation as, you know, really an equal citizen. And I think, you know, people who are involved in software know that de sometimes documentation comes last or comes once and then never gets updated. And, you know, for something like this, uh, for OpenHPC, where you're actually trying to install a system, you know, from bare metal, you really don't want that to be too frustrating. You need to keep that up to date. And so one of the things that we've tried to do from a design point of view is just treat the documentation as something that you need to validate just like everything else. And what, that's the reason we've chosen LaTeX as opposed to something like Word. And the, what it means is that we can sort of call out all of the instructions that we were recommending to run, and we can test them just like they are in the install guide. But because we need to support multiple distros, it's convenient to do, you know, to abstract things a little bit more. So I did just want to show one example that we use to go between CentOS and SLES, and that's an example where there's two different package managers. One's YUM, one's CentOS. But you don't want to have two different versions of the guide, right? You really want to try to have one as much as possible. So if you were to go look in our GitHub site and look at the raw LaTeX, you would see some craziness, and it's crazy syntax, I know, but this gets um, updated where hey, there's something that we need to install a group called OHPC base, and when it is defined for CentOS, it gets mapped to YUM. When it's defined for SLES, it gets mapped to Zipper. All right, so these are, you know, we're trying to hopefully do some reasonable things here in terms of abstracting um, our ability to support multiple base OSs. Uh, in terms of other things that you might need if you were to go download this and start from scratch, Today, uh, OpenHPC is leveraging an image-based provisioner, which happens to be Werewolf. This means you are pixie booting, and the people who've installed clusters should be very familiar with this. Um, you know, in this particular Werewolf configuration, that means it's stateless. Uh, so if you want to install something new, you reboot the node, right? You rebuild the image and reboot the node. Um, in terms of you know, things that you need to know, there are things that we, you know, obviously we can't know in advance, like MAC addresses of your compute nodes and maybe you know, what, how you'd like to define your subnet and that kind of stuff. So when you look through the guide, there's a lot of variables that are included, and that's where we can abstract things so that um, you can define them for your site and then use the rest of the install guide to install them. And just walking very quickly through you know, what an install might look like, I mentioned you start from the base OS, and then you start picking things that um, make sense for your particular uh, cluster. And one of the things that we're doing is we're providing convenience aliases here to relate functionality. And, and uh, you're going to be hard pressed to see this, but this thing in orange here, this, this is installing a provisioner. But as opposed to installing six or seven different packages that you need to have the provisioner, what this says is OHPC Werewolf, right? And this is a convenience alias that we create, which maps to seven or eight different packages. And it's just trying to make it a little bit easier on, um, on you so you don't have to know all of them. And we do that for things that have sort of client server types of uh, interfaces as well. So, you know, today in, in OpenHPC, there's the Slurm resource manager. So there's a, a convenience alias for the Slurm server. There's also a convenience alias for the Slurm client. Um, and, and there's lots of these kinds of examples. I just wanted to make you aware that there are some convenience groups defined. There's also some, um, you know, one of the things that we realized having done this once, and we said there's a lot of cut and paste that you do from an install guide. And if you really wanted to reproduce, like there was a question, can I, can I, you know, log into this thing and try it out? And we said, well, you can't, but you can go download it and do it. But you may not really want to sit there and cut and paste a lot of stuff. So, and we don't want to cut and paste when we're doing validation. So um, one of the things that is also included with the documentation is there is a, a script that is installed that has all the commands that would come from the documentation. So if you wanted to, you could just use that script, set some environment variables um, you know, with your network settings, and use that as a basis for installing an OpenHPC cluster and customizing it to fit. 
right? And if you could read this, it would tell you the path to this uh, particular thing. But um, trust me, it is there, and it's actually installed. You know, we have, sticking with the RPM theme, our documentation gets installed as, a, as an RPM as well. And uh, so there's a, there's a docs OHPC, you can install that, and then there's a, an install recipe that's sitting there. And that's mentioned in the, in the user guide if you're interested. So I, I just wanted to point it out as being available. And we have a few minutes left, so the last thing I want to talk about is integration testing and, and how um, it's an important component. So, you know, we are, we've included an a suite of integration tests, and the only thing I want to point out is that, you know, we're not trying to reproduce the validation testing that happens from the components itself, right? We assume that when MVAPPitch releases a new version of MVAPPitch that it's awesome. And same with you know, other components that are out there. We're not trying to reproduce that. The problem is that you can make a lot of mistakes building it and installing it and, and getting it to run right on, on an InfiniBand-based system. So what we're focusing is on is the integration aspect and how these components interact with each other. And so you know, we're trying to test our installation recipes, cross-package in, interaction, um, really trying to mimic use cases that happen during HPC deployments. And so the kinds of things that we're really looking at are can we build a cluster? Um, after we build the cluster from bare metal, can we use it? You know, can we run jobs through it? And did all the applications that we provided in third-party libraries, um, you know, can, we, can we actually build applications against them? So that's a lot of what we do in, uh, in the integration testing. Because it involves system installation and um, user development, it implies that you know, some things you have to have root credentials to do, and other things you, you run as a, as a regular user. And so you know, that's what we're trying to show here, is that it really is a gamut of tests that are part of this integration suite. And I'm going to just um, briefly mention the user level tests. So one of the things you know, that we try to be very, stick to our guns to, is that if there's a component that is open H in OpenHPC, there needs to be a test against it, right? And I think most people would agree that's a reasonable kind of thing to do, as long as you can keep it up. And so, you know, this is just highlighting the fact that if you were to run this test harness, which is, which is part of um, uh, OpenHPC, that, and you do it as a regular user, and you looked at sort of the configure output, you'll notice that there's a lot of different things that get enabled. And it's because there's a one-to-one -one mapping between all of the components that we've identified, right? I, again, I'm sorry that it's difficult to read. But you know, when I showed the components, there was something like SuperLU, there was Trilinos, there was Petsy. So we have packaging, you know, we have tests that map against all that. And that's what we're trying to show here. The other thing that is important is that we need to test against all of the compiler and MPI permutations. So we do try to abstract that process as well. Because we know we have all of these um, pre-built, let's say it's Petsy, for example. Well, the test harness just loops over all of those families and re recreates a test against Petsy for each of the six combinations that we might have. All right, and what that ultimately ends up with is a fair bit of tests, and I'll show you the final summary here in a second. Uh, but let me show you one example of the kinds of things that we might do. So this is a sub-module test in action for LMOD. And because you know, modules is such an important aspect of, of the user environment, you need to make sure that modules are working as well. And so this is highlighting that uh, some example tests that we have in our integration suite for making sure that when you purge a module that it does the right thing, when you swap a module that it does the right thing. And also, we end up doing an awful lot of commands where we submit to the resource manager. right? And, and the experience I've had in the past you know, working on a big system is that you often do things perfectly on a login node. And then the user goes and tries to use a binary, for example, that they just built in the resource manager, and there's some library missing, or some command fails for whatever reason, right? So the whole point is that we want to mimic things that are being done by the user. So we run a bunch of stuff through the resource manager as well. And, and just to echo that point home, um, let me switch to where it says our total number of tests. So here's the total number of integration tests that we end up running today with OpenHPC, the first version. And you'll notice there's something like 1,700, 1,800 tests. But to be fair, that gets magnified by this explosion of MPI and compiler family. So you know, it's not nobody sat around and wrote 1,700 individual tests just yet. But maybe. We need an intern. We'll get this number up. Um, but it is a lot of tests. We take it seriously. Um, 
it takes a, you know, a couple of hours to run here. You can see it's almost three hours. We're running this today on Mellanox FDR and TrueScale. And in terms of the number of jobs which get run through the resource manager, it's something like, you know, it's in excess of 1,000 jobs which get run as part of this exercise. So we're almost finished. So let me just um, summarize and say that, you know, we've hopefully I've given you an introduction uh, of the community. We've got a lot of community collateral that's available. So the main website is openhpc.community. There's a GitHub site. Um, and to be honest, everything that I'm showing here, if you only were to look at one thing, you can reference everything associated with the effort from openhpc.community. I do want to point out, though, that there is an actual YUM repository. And I, I alluded to the fact that it's sitting on our OBS server. So if you wanted to just say that you did install a package, you could point your YUM repo to this and install some packages. Um, one of the things we're working on is making sure that we have some CI visibility uh, in the future. Um, I've shown you plots of it, but I don't have a, a public build server just yet. And there's a number of mailing lists, a number of ways to participate. You know, I, I alluded to a couple, suggest components to add, get involved. You know, that's the best way to get your component added is, is maybe help, and that means writing integration tests as well. Um, share site knowledge, create new recipes. Um, contribute test infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved. And um, with that, since I'm, I'm at the end, let me stop and just say thank you for your time. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but we can try. Thank you. Yes, sir. ISV code. Right. So the question is kind of oriented around how do we see ISV um, applications fitting into this space. And um, I'll say a couple of things. We'll open it up. Some other people might have comments. But um, you know, one of the reasons, the motivators for talking about this bring your own license model is specifically to address the capability to support ISV codes. And they may be applications. They might not be, right? They might be some other middle level, middle layer type of code. Um, but we're very sensitive to the fact, and in fact, Brock, who, who has much more experience on sort of the, the ISV code and, and the volume scale, we're very sensitive to the fact that people who are interested in a, you know, a Fluent or an ANSYS or something like that, they care about the code much more than they care about what the software stack looks like. But from the ISV perspective, and I, by the way, I used to work at one of these. I worked at the folks who did um, Star CD and CD Adapco. We cared, actually, even though we're selling the code, we care about the environment in which it's deployed. right? And we also would spend enormous amounts of time debugging people's cluster environment. And in fact, we had to, right? Because we were on the hook. We were, we were getting, they were paying for it. It had to work, even if it, it was a hardware problem. It was so they're motivated by the fact that it, anything that we can do to minimize um, the pain in deploying the system and managing it is good. Also in diagnostics, so that's why you see something like cluster checker being involved because you know everybody, you know anybody who's done a, an HPC system knows it only takes one node, right, to to blow the whole thing up. And if you're buying an ISV, you know if you're buying a system for an ISV code, you don't you don't call the hardware people, you call the ISV people, right? And so I see this being beneficial to all because we can provide diagnostic capability. You see a, a, a test harness here. There's nothing preventing us from having test harnesses for an ISV code, right? So I think there is, you, you know, we're just starting, so we don't have that yet, but, but we're designing it so that we can accommodate um, 
helping ISV folks and just general purpose, you know, open source folks. You bet. Yes, sir. Right. So do you have the best recipe on how to reduce the, the, the footprint on the memory of the image? Yeah, great question. So, um, and the question folks didn't hear is about how does you sort of rein in the size of the, of the image that you might be pushing out? And particularly in this example where I'm talking about it being a diskless type of state, stateless kind of environment. So one of the things, um, there are multiple angles to go with, right? And, and when you stick with diskless, this is something you have to be very sensitive about. You can't, get, you can't have the image be so big that you lose all the memory on your compute node, right? Um, so in the example that you would see if in, in OpenHPC 1, 1.0, the approach that's taken to start with is because it's starting off for a modest size system, say, you know, several hundred nodes in this example, um, the approach that's taken is the image is pretty small on the order of two to 300 megabytes. In fact, I, I had a summary at the end. Our current one is around 270 megabytes, something like that. And we try to keep that reasonably small for the reasons you're talking about. But we install you know, a lot of the third party packages into a shared file system. So if you went through the recipe that um, is available today, you would see things like Petsy and all that kind of stuff not being imaged to the node. Right? It, would be a, it would be installed into a third party uh, shared file system, either NFS or even better, Lustre. So, for example, at TAC, we would, if we were doing an environment like this where we didn't, um, we weren't doing a, a stateful system, we would install it into Lustre because we would get much higher performance. So that's one way to do it. Another way is, of course, to go the the disk full route, and then you just provision all of these things local to the node, and then there's no ambiguity either. Um, there are some options, so the particular provisioner that was chosen here, which is called Werewolf, has this capability to hybridize sort of what gets put on the node and what doesn't. Um, and that's something that we're looking to sort of document as another alternative to deal with this problem. I don't know how over I am, but I'm okay? Oh, I could have talked for hours then. What am I doing? No. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know how we're distributing them, but I, sure. Um, if you want to, does anybody know, are these all going on a shared site, Misty? Okay. Yeah, if somebody needs one right away, just give me your card. With a $100 bill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it.